Welcome to the Creative Writing Career Podcast, where you learn how to make writing more than a hobby. Make it a career. And here are your hosts, Stefan Bugai, Justin Sloan, and Kevin Tomlinson. Hi, and welcome to Creative Writing Career Podcast. This is Stefan Bugai. I'm here with my hosts, co-hosts, Justin Sloan and Kevin Tomlinson, and Emmy-winning veteran TV writer Bob Goodman. Um, Bob is... Uh, longtime veteran of the television industry. He's written on a bunch of awesome Batman, Superman, Justice League TV series. And um, he's also written for video games and web series and is currently a writer on my personal favorite TV show that's on right now, Elementary. So thanks for being on, Bob. My pleasure. Thanks for the intro. Thanks. Um, so let me start off with a, a, a question for you about um, TV writing. So uh, for a lot of our listeners, they know that with um, films, comic books, uh, novels, and even games, there is a lot of um, different ways to break in. A very common one of which right now is to create your own thing. Make a micro-budget film, find an artist and make a comic, find a team and make an indie game. But there doesn't really seem to be a parallel to that in television. People aren't necessarily going out and making micro-budget pilots and getting their career started that way. So I think for our listeners who are interested in TV writing as a career, um, what is the path for people to get into that industry these days? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. It's funny, the, the examples you gave, um, not that they never work out in TV, but, but I'd almost advise against. Um, the, uh, the way that most people break into careers in TV are, are by one of two routes. Um, one is just getting in the door any way you can, meaning usually as a production assistant or a writer's assistant. Um, every TV show in LA has a, uh, a writer's room with, uh, you know, somewhere in the round range of, you know, eight to a dozen writers, uh, who gather every day, uh, to, uh, either work literally in a room together all day or in their independent offices. A place like that has a support staff. There's going to be assistants whose jobs uh, are just about supporting those writers, um, uh, an assistant directly to the showrunner. Uh, if it is a writer's room show, and we can get more into the, the specifics of that language in a second, but if it's a writer's room based show, there's going to be somebody who's performing as uh, what's called the writer's room assistant, which is kind of imagine the, the courtroom stenographer, just kind of keeping notes on everything being said in the room. Um, there's script coordinators whose job are, are involve um, uh, formatting scripts, distributing them to uh, to the individual departments involved in production, um, and and all of these jobs. Uh, there, there's PAs, um, people who sounds sounds unglamorous, but it's mostly about office supplies and getting lunch and Starbucks runs and things like that. But they're all understood to be people who are themselves aspiring writers and building the relationships with the people who are going to hire them one day. And very often shows promote from within, um, uh, give out freelance assignments. There are actually guidelines in the Writers Guild that uh, mandate that uh, shows give out a certain number of freelances a year. And generally those freelances and those opportunities to get a leg up, go to the people already on the inside. So getting a job, you know, in, in that building in any form you can is, is probably the best way to, to get into the business. The other way, um, is to get, uh, spec scripts to all of the, uh, the studio and network fellowship programs and workshop programs. Uh, most, if not all, of the, the major companies, uh, uh, NBC, Disney, Fox, Warner Brothers, have programs that the name varies, but they're usually something like a writer's workshop or a writer's fellowship program um, that are designed to read the sample work of um, uh, talented writers who haven't gotten their foot in the door yet. Um, often they uh, have a focus on promoting diversity, so there's a, they're, they're looking for uh, people of color and women um, to uh, to help get into the business. And those programs really give you a great leg up because, one, again, you're meeting people. Uh, the programs usually involve um, mentorship elements where you're assigned people learning the business to mentor you. Um, they uh, include sort of lectures with 
uh, people already in the business. So you get a chance to be in front of them and, and hear them talk. And, and if you're good at it, you know, maybe share some contact information. And then at the back end, um, those programs subsidize the, the graduates of the program getting onto shows. So in other words, what the studios and networks are doing is investing in their own talent pool. They support the budgets to put you in these programs. And then when someone gets out of the program, um, you know, even, even at an entry level, television writers are pretty high paying gig rather than the price of that new writer getting, um, uh, uh, put against the, the budget of the show that's taking them, um, half or sometimes even all of the cost of that writer for the first year will be, will be, considered part of the budget of that fellowship program. So it is an incentive to shows that are at those individual studios and networks to hire writers out of their programs. All of that is a, uh, a really long winded answer um, to, something <laughs> That's I, a great to something that I could have summed up in just a, a, a couple of words. I, I, I kind of have, you know, obviously you get asked the question, you know, how do you break into, uh, into TV writing? Very yeah. often, I kind of have it narrowed down to about three or four sentences. So after the I, long I, answer, I'll, I'll give you the short one. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I, no, no. I was going to say, as as an Asian black uh, woman myself, I, I, uh -huh. I find it very encouraging <laughs> that I can get in on a uh, diversity program. But what about uh, you know redhead white guys like like Justin? How would he uh, get a leg up? <laughs> well, I'm a veteran, uh, so I have that going for me. <laughs> Bam. Oh, man, I, yeah, I'm the uh, only actually, one here who has no shot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm I'm a I'm a New York born bespectacled Jew. I had I had no chance of <laughs> you know where we are we are the most common species in TV writing and, and yeah. in Hollywood. Um, and so the, the, the short version is move to LA, network with everybody you can, and write, write, write. And that's, yeah. that's really, you have to be writing your own spec samples. I guess that's the analogy to the, you know, doing your own shorts and, and indie games and things you were talking about is you, you have to be building a portfolio. Your writing samples are your resume um, before you have anything else on it. Um, would it, would it be poor form to plug another podcast on your podcast? No, we love doing oh. that. We call it podcast bombing, and I do it all the time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so a, a podcast bomb, please. Um, there's a really, really great um, instructive podcast. I think it's, it's well over a dozen episodes now, like maybe 15, maybe more, called childrenoftendu.com. Oh, yeah. okay. You guys know it, huh? I know it. I, I love it. I, I listened to that when I was trying to get into Telltale, and it was like my, you know, my, my daily education. Yeah. Um, so that's, uh, that's hosted by um, two terrific writers and, and friends of mine, uh, in full disclosure, um, Javier Grio Marxwatch and Jose Molina. Uh, and they, they cover every aspect of what it takes to uh, get in and stay in and, and have a good career as, as a television writer. The, the, uh, the episodes are generally organized by an individual subject, uh, like, you know, how to get an agent, um, writing your spec scripts, um, staffing season, um, the writer's room once you're in and they, they really, they get everything right and they answer every question. Uh, so I, I highly recommend people go there. Right after all the time it's been here. <laughs> yeah. I'd also say it's very relevant to the video game world and even their advice in, in, on writing in general is relevant to the novel and all this other publishing world. Absolutely. I'm sure it all, you know, the, the most important advice probably is the same anywhere, which is, you know, network with people, you know, be, be where the action is. Don't be a dick. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Be, be, being likable is a really important part of having a career where, you know, there's lots of other people to, you know, who you need to say a good word about you and, and want to hire you when they go to the next job. And then just, you know, keep producing material, you know, whatever it is you want to do, the people who are figuring out a way to do it on their own and not have excuses not to do it are the ones who succeed. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're kind of on that topic uh, uh, real quick. I'm hearing myself echo. I hope nobody else hears that, but, um, nope. um Okay, great. So people who have published, you know, a lot of books or people who are working in the video game industry or comic industry, uh, would you say that they still have the same steps towards uh, succeeding in the film industry or they kind of have a leg up already? 
Well, I mean, there's a, there's a great advantage to already having material to show. Um, but I, I don't know if someone, you know, who, who shows up at the, uh, at the doorstep of, you know, that first agent or that first showrunner that their stuff gets in front of, um, if they should expect to have a leg up on the person who's been, you know, writing spec scripts of the, uh, in the format that they're looking for. And, um, original pilots, TV pilots are, uh, are really valued these days that that kind of ebbs and flows, whether they, whether people really want to see samples of your work, um, okay. that match you know, like s- samples of existing TV shows or your, your own voice and your own pilot. But I think those are a lot more important, um, to people hiring in television than, you know, if you've written games or shorts and, and, and you know, I, I apologize if that sounds discouraging. I mean, the, the, the good news is, you know, if you can do that, if you have the, you know, the DNA to generate material, then, you know, you're already ahead of most people and, and just turn that focus to generating the material you need to get this job. Great. So it yeah. might be more of a talking point or resume point than, uh, like you said, it's not going to give you the advantage necessarily, but look at it more as like a, you have that experience and you can use it in the room to bring up topics. Or whatnot. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely for sure. I mean, one thing that this business values very highly is diverse experience. Um, not, not just, a, not just diverse genetics. Um, <laughs> that's good. Uh, diverse. Um, you know, it's, it's a, uh, uh, a sad state that, that some writers, you know, bemoan, but, but it's understandable that, you know, someone could have been writing, for, for years and years and have a, I mean, even, even exactly the right kind of, you know, let's say if, if you're you know, laser focused on what you want to write is, I'll take an example, legal procedurals. Uh, by, by the way, anytime I like, if I say any jargon that you think needs to be explained, you know, like I've used words like specs and procedurals and, if, and anything you feel like we need to back up and talk about, just say so. But um, let's, let's say you're writing, you know, you have, you have a, a file cabinet full of your, um, original pilots and spec legal procedurals, and you've been doing this for years, and maybe even have um, been writing in TV in some form or video games or, or um, making your own shorts for years. And like you have proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are a great, great writer. And then you're up for a job on a new legal show against a guy who was, you know, an assistant district attorney in some major city who just decided at 35 years old that boy, he might want to be a TV writer. He's actually very likely to get preference for that job because he's going to bring the experience of, you know, he's actually done this job. Um, and he's actually, you know, got real stories to help feed the mill. Um, one of the most important things, um, show runners are looking to their staffs from what, whatever, uh, shape the, uh, the writing staff takes, whether it's a room based show or non room based show, um, is just story generation. You know, one of the most valued writers on any show is, is the person who just can go, Hey, you know, when, uh, back when I worked as an X, Y, Z, or, you know, when I was, uh, um, uh, actually a DA in, in, in Detroit or, you know, whatever it is, then they know this happened and this happened and that gets a new story on the board. You know, that, that's, that's incredibly, incredibly valued. And um, to kind of turn that to, to some personal experience, um, I, I started always, you know, knowing I was going to go into showbiz and, and, and writing was a focus for a, a really long time. Um, but I definitely did a bunch of other jobs before moving out to L.A. and things really started breaking here. And so before I ever started writing TV, I had already done. Um, years as a computer programmer, um, years as a pharmacy technician. In my case, um, I'd worked as a uh, an assistant and technical writer to a medical device inventor, um, and so I had, I know a lot of those experiences that I that I've always on any show I'm on been able been able to bring um, to those things, and and you know, it happens. People seem to like my writing too, but uh, but it's really a uh, 
it's really a plus to have that life experience. I mean, sometimes when someone, when, when all they've done is right, then it tells the people looking to hire you less about what it is you're going to bring to the table. It's encouraging for us veterans coming on Veterans Day. That's when we're recording this, everybody. So I'm all like, yeah, veterans, let's promote it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, and, and thank you for your service, by the way. Thank you. Um, I was, I, uh, was going to mention this uh, off uh, the record, but might as well mention it on Plug a Friend, now that I know that you're, <laughs> you're good at plugging podcasts. Yeah. Um, some, <laughs> someone else you should, you should put on your list to talk to, since I know you have, since you are a veteran, have this focus on veterans. Uh, a writer that I worked with on Warehouse 13, a guy named Derek Hughes. Okay. Great, um, great, great guy, great writer. Um, thankfully, having a you know successful career as a TV writer uh, is a former U.S. Marine, mm. um, and definitely has been something that you know comes up in the writers' room. And and you know we, you know, uh, if you work with someone like that, you look, you know, a, a question's going to come up. You know, hey, what's this? What's the truth about this? What happened when you did this? And, and all those experiences make people more valuable. Awesome. Even if we don't get him on the show, at least now we know he's an awesome guy and we'll try. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> hey, Bob, um, I was wondering, uh, you've mentioned a couple times now uh, room-based shows versus non-room-based shows. And I think our listeners could definitely use some clarification about the different kinds of TV shows, how they work, and, and right. you know, how they're approached by writers in each different case. Hey, let me throw in there too. Like, I think some uh, of our listeners, you know, I, I've been approached by people who don't realize the kind of hours that these shows take, and, and so maybe when you're talking about that, talking about like what the commitment is to on these kind of shows, would be awesome. Sure. Um, uh, be before I get uh, move away from Derek, I just want to mention uh, for you know just to be proper about all this, uh, Derek works with a writing partner named Benjamin Rabb. So Ben and Derek are a team, and uh, if you guys were to look for, to have those guys on, I would recommend you know getting them on as a team. Cool. Um, yeah. You can get stuff about writing partnerships in there too, and uh, and they actually came through one of these uh, uh, network programs that I'm talking about. They uh, they got their breakthrough NBC's program, which is called Writers on the Verge. So you can talk about all sorts of things with those guys, and they're both fantastic guys and great writers. Awesome, That's great. Um, Plug for a future episode right there. That's there good. you go. Oh, you, <laughs> you, you have yeah, you you have a, your a full a full docket there with those two. Awesome. Yeah. Well, and writing with writing partners is something that we are definitely interested in. We that's come up a lot, so that'd be a good one. <laughs> hey, let me uh, let me podcast bomb too. We're doing a, a separate podcast called Military Veterans and Creative Careers that launches on Veterans Day. So by the time this airs, it'll be out. But um, so so that's another way. I'll, I'm going to hit up Derek for both of those. So thank you so much for that. But now to your to your answers. <laughs> All right. So two. Um, so yeah, kind of starting from the beginning. Um, uh, writing staffs. I mentioned have, you know, the, the number of, uh, of writers on the staff will vary, but um, it's, you know, usually somewhere in that, you know, eight, give or take. They can be as high as, as a dozen. I mean, they really, there's no limit in either direction. Um, one person could write a whole season or you could have, you know, 15 people in a room. Um, historically, I'm not sure if it's still true, um, uh, comedies tend to have larger writers' rooms than dramas. Um, the, uh, there's just so much more of a premium put on everybody sitting around a table and brainstorming and throwing out jokes that, uh, you know, you kind of want more heads on a comedy. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, then once you, you're on that, uh, that staff, um, there's kind of two main models of, of what the, the day-to-day -day operation looks like. I mean, these are just kind of the more, the more common models, but they can, uh, you know, anything goes, there's no hard and fast rules. Um, so the, the first one that people think about when they, you know, when you imagine a, a TV writing staff is, is the writer's room. Um, what that looks like is, um, and warehouse 13 was, was a show like this. So speaking from, from my experience on that show, um, uh, you've got your, your, 10 dozen writers who, you know, have an actual time of day that you're expected to be in the office and you've got an individual office. Um, but you spend most of your day, I mean, often eight, 10 hours a day, um, uh, all sitting around uh, a giant conference table. You know, it looks, looks like a conference room, like any other business would have only kind of the, um, the focal point of that room, uh, uh is, the fact that the walls, at, at least one long wall, and often all the walls that are available, 
are covered with whiteboards, with, with dry erase boards. Um, and as a group, uh, everyone will get together and sit in that room all day, day in, day out, and you know, knock down those stories one by one, um, break the, uh, you know, the, the beat by beat workings of, of each story, discuss the longer arcs, um, discuss you know, what you're, you know, when you're going to reveal this detail about who this character's father was, when you're going to you know, finally pay off the will they or won't they and have the two characters sleep together, what you're, you know, who your big bad is which is our term for the, the bad guy of the season is, you know, all those kind of questions. Um, and generally speaking, um, very early in the process of a given episode, um, if not determined from the very beginning of the season, um, you'll have a sense of who will ultimately be assigned to be the writer on this particular episode number. If you're on, you know, episode six of the season, we're breaking them all together, but we all know that, you know, Dave is the... Uh, is going to be the, the writer on episode six. So, you know, he or she, if Dave happens to be a woman, um, is, uh, is paying, you know, extra close attention uh, to, to all the, the stuff that's being broken and, and hopefully, you know, infusing a lot of his or herself into that story and kind of driving it. Um, there's, like I mentioned before, the writer's room assistant keeping notes, uh, you know, uh, uh, typing up whatever it is we put on the board. And then once the, uh, the group as a whole, and more importantly, the showrunner, who's always the captain of this ship, whatever else the dynamics are among the rest of the group, um, once everyone's happy with how that story looks, that individual writer will take the stuff that's been put up on, on the big whiteboards and go off and write, up, write an outline of that. That outline is then vetted by whoever needs to vet it, the showrunner. Um, some shows will table that outline, some won't, which means, you know, that everybody else in the group gets to, you know, give some feedback, give some notes, or sometimes that, you know, some shows don't do that step. Then it goes to studio, goes to network. Once everybody signed off on the outline, uh, being happy, um, that individual writer is sent off to script. And for that period of time, for however long it takes to write an outline and the script, that writer isn't part of the writer's room. But the rest of the writers are all in the writer's room together, hammering out the next episode and the next episode. So it's kind of this rotation process of everyone being in the room except whoever it is that's at bat at the time. Um, Non-writer's room shows uh, kind of operate more independent study. Um, everything is more uh, relationships between the individual writers on the staff and the showrunner. Um, it happens. I've been on more shows shaped like this. The uh, all the animation stuff that I did was handled as as non room. Um, uh, this show, Elementary, is a non room show. Um, shows like that, um, each person is spending most of their time in their own office, coming up with stories. You know, here's the murder mystery Sherlock and Joan have to solve this week. Um, here's um, you know, the latest thing Joker does when he escapes from Arkham that Batman has to stop. Um, and those are then um, pitched either in writing or verbally directly from that writer to that showrunner. Um, and the showrunner will, you know, sort of working in serial instead of in parallel, you know, work with an individual writer until they get that story hammered out and then send that writer off to outline and script, then go on to the next writer and hammer that one out. And um, so it's, it's much less team effort. The, uh, the whole group stays involved in everything. There's always the opportunity for everybody to give feedback. And uh, we will sometimes generate what we call mini rooms where, okay, uh, two or three people on their own, either when they're working on a story might get together or when, the showrunner has anointed an individual in their story as the next one up might gather a few brains together to, to break this one. So like the, the break in the room with the whiteboards looks very similar, but with a lot fewer people. Um, and then, you know, all goes well by the end of the season, either one of those models, you've churned out the whole season's worth of stories in general, one, one uh, little inside detail about these the soapier shows, the more character-based shows, the shows that have more long, intricate arcs uh, operate better with the, with the room. Um, they're, they're 
you know, virtually impossible to do in a non-room setting because everybody obviously needs to know what everybody else is doing. Um, the, the shows that tend to have more luck in a non-room setting are the procedural shows, the, the, the murder mysteries, uh, the superhero shows, the shows where there is, you know, a story you are telling in a closed ended way, you know, a closed ended a plot that, that each week. Um, and then if there are serial elements, it's the B plot and those things can be, you know, woven into the, uh, the individual episodes after you've, uh, you've figured out what the A plot is this week. Awesome. Great. So if That's... somebody was looking to get on a show that was kind of more of a non-room show, like you said, those kind of shows are the ones they should look out for, but is there any way to, to kind of gauge that aside from just the kind of show it is? Well, if you're, if you're asking, you know, uh, what, uh, actually I'm, I'm going to answer a question you didn't ask first. Okay. Uh, which, 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 which is, you know, would a writer do that? Right. Would a writer yeah. you know, look, look at the world and say, hey, I really want to be on room-based shows or I really want to be on non-room-based shows. Um, and while um, sure there is some, you know, ability to, you know, gauge which show is with and there's definitely... Um, you know, Intel out there. I mean, if you're, if it, you're talking about a, an existing show, um, you know, uh, I, you know, I, I can find out with a phone call, you know, which, which shows are room based shows, which shows are non room based shows. Obviously you can tell from the nature of the show. Um, and when someone is, you know, uh, pretty established in their career, um, you know, has done both kind of knows what they like and what they don't like. Um, they certainly might start to cherry pick their jobs, mm -hmm. um, you know, go, ah, you know, I've been, I've been on non-room shows and, and the room is really what gets my juices flowing and why I'm doing this. I mean, I, I personally would, would throw in that the room is my favorite part of being a TV writer. Mm. Um, and it happens I'm, you know, I'm on a non-room show now and I'm loving the hell out of it. Um, but, uh, uh, no, um, uh, now to, 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 to back up to somebody starting out, you, you one, wouldn't have that information as available. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the reason for that is generally starting writers are, are more likely to get their breaks on shows that are just starting up. Um, that's the most likely show for a, for a network to put you on. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and two, it'd be really ill-advised to, you know, for a beggar to be a chooser. Uh, right. at that point, you know, also you've never done it. So go and see which one you like. Yeah. So, you might prefer one over the other. Yeah. You, you might, might. <laughs> might turn out to love it. Yeah. Yeah. Ken, I think we're coming up to yeah. our close, um, but we, maybe we each have one closer question on a, I, I heard a couple yeah. of people's voices jump in for sure. Um, yeah. So Bob, I was just wondering for our, our listeners, if, um, there's any common things that you see in, um, spec scripts that people have put together that are, easy fixes. I mean, of course, there's the years of learning the craft, but I think there's also, you know, trends and, and, uh, and in that people want to see and common mistakes that people make, even though they're good writers that maybe, uh, the benefit of your experience could help some people steer away from those. Sure. That, that's a, that's a great question. Um, that, that you don't hear us very often, but the, the, the short and, and easy answers, uh, are one format, um, uh, and two voice. Um, and you know, the, the, the headline over both of those is the, the purpose of a spec script. And this is, this is separate from uh, doing your own original pilot. But if you are you know, looking out there at the world and saying elementary is the, is the show I love um, or that's the kind of show I love. Um, and, you know, I want to be in, uh, you know, strong character murder mystery procedurals. And so you've picked elementary as the kind of show that you want to write a spec of. Your job immediately becomes learn that show inside and out and emulate it as closely as possible. Um, I think starting writers uh, deeply undervalue the importance of imitation in, in, in the job. And, and, or I'm actually, I'm going to stop. I won't use the word imitation, but emulation. Um, that uh, the way my showrunner, Rob Doherty, puts it here is, your job as a writer is to trick me into thinking I wrote it. Uh, ah, I like it. Yeah, it's, it's a great way of putting it that I'd never heard of you said. Um, you, when, when someone's reading your spec, they're looking to see, um, are you going to make my job easier? Um, your job is not to 
you know, show them how much cleverer than the show you are or this like brilliant new twist on the show or place the show's never gone before that you can bring to it. You want to do, it's, it's an interesting line you have to walk. You have to do a spec that is, you know, something the show hasn't done before, but that the show would do that is, you know, in the wheelhouse yeah. of the show, not so far out there. So, but, but so not only are you looking to match like the voice of the characters uh, and, and, you know, get the story structure and what makes their out, act outs run and, you know, how many beats per act and sort of get all that right. You even want to get the punctuation right and the turns of phrase right. And, you know, whether this showrunner is a stickler for one space after the period or two, you know, like you want to drill so deep down into everything this show is doing on the page that when that showrunner reads that script, it's like, I didn't even notice I wasn't reading one of my own scripts. So that, that there's your answer. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's I great. think we are out of time guys. Uh, Bob, thank you so much for joining us. I, I don't know if you have any like kind of last words of wisdom you want to leave us with or ways people can find your, find your work. Of course, just Google your shows and IMDb, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty Googleable. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, when, one last bit of advice I'd give anybody at any point in their careers, beginning, middle, end, uh, is, is always keep your eye on the long picture. I think people worry too much about, you know, this, this script being the one that is, you know, my magnum opus, this staffing year being the one where I make my break, um, when they're in the job, this, you know, line of dialogue that I'm fighting for and just sort of you you come to the right answer of how to behave in a career every time you think about just you know focusing on the long game of the career focusing on being in relationships with these people for years to come keeping your ego out of it um and and you know just being a good guy awesome advice hard for yeah, so to it, follow it goes back to what you said earlier i think we can sum it up with don't be a dick and don't write, be a dick. write right yeah <laughs> yeah that's it Great. <laughs> Thank we'll you do so it. much, Bob. This has been really fantastic. <laughs> yeah, thank you, listener. <laughs> All right, take care, guys. This has been the Creative Writing Career Podcast. Thanks so much for listening to the Creative Writing Career Podcast with your hosts, Stefan Bugai, Justin Sloan, and Kevin Tomlinson. We'll catch you next time.